I'll take you out on the dock. Here's the, Thank you. you got it. For me, you know, it's a, a life of, uh, of crabs and fishing and chickens and oysters and uh, um, PFAS contamination. Go figure. I actually picked up uh, uh, my morning paper uh, one day and saw a headline that said the next Flint may be in northern Michigan or something like that. And I thought, oh boy, that's really bad. And then I, they had a picture, it was a picture of my lake. These training facilities would spray this firefighting foam where it wash into the ground, wash into a nearby stream, and it's actually soaked into the ground and contaminated uh, groundwater and surface water in most bases across the country. I feel betrayed because I didn't sign up to be poisoned. You know, I signed up to serve my country. You know, I signed up willingly. But one thing I never expected was that, you know, the job that I was doing was poisoning me. The place that I was living was poisoning me. We were test subjects. The military's use of a firefighting foam with the intention to save lives could have dire consequences for the people who handled it and the people who live nearby. Now, communities are wondering what it means for their health and their homes, and who's responsible to clean it all up. The investigations are tangled up in politics and national security. The chemicals in the foam itself are the subject of corporate lawsuits, scientific discovery, and an ongoing threat to human health. We know the anecdote that the uh, Roman Empire uh, went down because of lead poisoning. But the PFAS is, I didn't, I mean, myself, I didn't know until like 10 or 12 years ago that um, th this was something that I might have to worry about. The U.S. military has used a firefighting foam called AFFF since the late 60s. It's good at putting out jet fuel fires really fast. But over the past couple decades, scientists have found that one of the chemical compounds that makes AFFF so effective might also be poisoning the people who live and work in and around the bases that use it. The chemicals at the center of it all are called PFAS short for per or polyfluoroalkyl substances. Think of PFAS like the umbrella term for hundreds of these chemical compounds that are based on fluorine carbon bonds. The most common ones are PFOS and PFOA. What make PFAS so useful in manufacturing is how the chemicals fit together. The fluorine atoms just so happen to fit perfectly around the carbon atoms to create a bond that resists things like heat, oil, and water. These chemical bonds are incredibly strong. They do not break down in the environment. And so that's actually what's led to a lot of the contamination issue. PFAS don't occur naturally in the environment. The chemical compounds were invented by scientists in the late 30s, early 40s. Then came two of the most widely used inventions that were made with PFAS, Teflon and Scotchgard. Those product lines have revolutionized home cooking and cleaning, along with the chemical industry itself. Today, PFAS are used in a ton of products, from raincoats to waterproof shoes, nonstick pots and pans, microwave popcorn bags, and even cosmetics. But over the last few decades, companies have had to shell out hundreds of millions of dollars in settlements over PFAS contamination stemming from manufacturing. 3M, DuPont, and Chemours settled these multi-million dollar cases without admitting any wrongdoing. The producers have said, oh, there's absolutely no risk, and uh, they're not dangerous, they're so stable. But that's exactly the problem. That's Philippe Grandjean, one of the world's leading PFAS researchers. Documents that have been made available in legal cases involving 3M and DuPont show the companies had been studying the health effects of PFAS for decades. One document is a 1999 resignation letter from a 3M environmental specialist, saying his resignation was prompted by his profound disappointment in the company's handling of risks associated with PFAS. In another instance, Bucky Bailey, the son of a former DuPont factory worker who worked in the Teflon division, 
was born with one nostril and a deformed eye. He's been outspoken about PFAS contamination, though the C8 science panel could not conclude his deformities were linked to PFAS. Chemors, which was spun off from DuPont in 2015, told CNBC it does not currently use PFOA or PFOS in any of its manufacturing processes. And 3M announced the phase out of the two PFAS compounds in 2000. To make sense of how the military fits into all of this, I called Dr. Stephen Termath, an Air Force official working on the cleanup of PFAS contamination at the Wurtsmith Air Force Base in Oscoda, Michigan. Active duty soldiers left the base in the 90s, but contamination from past firefighting activity is still there. They would usually have an area that they would use steel and other things there. It didn't even look like an aircraft, but they might put a couple of plates on there that look like wings or stuff that they would have there. They used then petroleum products to ignite into a fire, and then they would approach that using a triple F to put out that fire to simulate fighting an aircraft. And they had to do that periodically to keep all the training up so that if a crash ever did happen, they were ready. Today, Wurtsmith is home to housing complexes, local businesses, and a giant filter that's working to remove PFAS from the water. Meanwhile, active military bases across the country are still using AFFF that contains PFAS, even though the military recognizes its dangers. That's because, technically, they're required to. Other countries like Australia have started to roll out fluorine-free alternatives. The U.S. Navy said it's working on developing a new PFAS-free formula and minimizing the additional release of the foam into the environment. Service members who have already been exposed to AFFF are trying to put the pieces together. I talked with James Bussey, an Air Force veteran who was stationed at Wurtsmith from 1989 to 1992. Yeah, of course, we drank the water, we showered in, but also I, I had two direct exposures to AFFF when uh, there was accidental discharge from a malfunction of the AFFF system where it filled the hangar while I was in the aircraft. It's saying anywhere from 8 to 10 feet. There was no protocols uh, for us to follow for exposure. Didn't think twice about it. It was sort of like just second nature. The Environmental Working Group and Northeastern University have been mapping out all of the known PFAS contamination sites across the U.S. As of July 2019, there were more than 700 locations across 49 states. 175 of those were military bases. The contamination at the hundreds of other locations were found at public water systems, airports, industrial plants, and firefighter training sites. And there have been reports of PFAS contamination on military bases in other countries too. But for this video, we're just going to focus on how it's affecting people in the US. Exposure to the chemical compound has been linked to some pretty serious health problems like miscarriages, thyroid disease, even cancer. These compounds, once they get into the body, they stay there and they stay there for a very, very long time, uh, perhaps even decades for some of them. And that is precisely what makes me worry that, uh, um, that they can cause adverse e effects in the long run, not just a matter of um, short-term uh, poisoning. About five years ago, I started to get sick. I was found to have damaged all my internal organs when I was sent to a uh, special VA facility in January. James had his blood tested for six types of PFAS in 2018. Despite not working with AFFF for more than two decades, his test results showed one type of PFAS, commonly used in firefighting foam, at levels more than three times the national average. The VA has not been able to definitively link this to any of his health conditions. So I started to do a little bit of research on Facebook and different uh, Air Force groups to see if I could find anybody that was suffering from similar circumstances to myself. And I started to find great numbers of people that I served with, especially that were having similar circumstances to myself or much worse. The communities who live around military bases are feeling the impact of PFAS contamination too. Water is huge. If you looked at an aerial map, you will see it's Lake Huron, it's Manhattan Lake, it's the Osabo River. So for recreational purposes, for sustainability purposes, people live off the, the, the fish and, and, and the wildlife there. So it's, I mean, 
If you take away the water in Oscoda, you take away Oscoda. Since PFAS don't naturally break down in the environment, the chemicals are still being found in the water from AFFF use in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Tony's Lake House, across from the former Wurtsmith Air Force Base, falls within the lines of what's been designated a zone of concern. You know, Environmental uh, Protection Agency first put out a provisional health advisory back in, uh, I was thinking somewhere around 2013, 2015. And that was a, a signal to the Air Force to begin looking for releases. It wasn't until 2016 that some Oscoda residents were first told not to drink the groundwater. That's when it first really was big time on my radar screen. Residents whose well water was contaminated were given bottled water and reverse osmosis filtration systems to use under their kitchen sink. We have been told that we can't eat the fish from the river. We've been told that we can't eat the venison from deer harvested within a five mile radius, essentially of the base. We've been told if you live in this zone of concern that you shouldn't drink your drinking water. We have swept these things under the rug for far too long, for decades, for convenience, for, for short-term profit. We're paying the piper now. For the people who swam in the lake and drank the water, the fallout is still unknown. People don't like to advertise their health problems. No one does. What I've seen in Oscoda is a, a lot of folks who are living in a kind of silent desperation. As a citizen activist nearby, I wanted to find out if there was any documented PFAS um, exposure to the people in this community, including me, because I'm only four or five miles away from the potential plume. It's possible. Exactly how far PFAS can travel in the environment has been debated. Scientists say it's anywhere from a few miles to all the way across the world. Just hop on the boat and, I, you know, you go right around here and ride about 10 minutes, you're in the bay, and another 10 minutes, you, you, you get to a point on a slightly cloudy day, you can't see land. I mean, it's huge. You know, there's just so much water here. Um, it's very much a part of things. The Patuxent River Naval Air Base near Pat wasn't listed in the Department of Defense's official report of those 401 bases suspected of releasing PFAS. However, Navy documents show levels of PFAS in the groundwater at roughly 16 times higher than the EPA's Lifetime Health Advisory. The Patuxent River Naval Air Base said it wasn't listed in the main DOD report because its final test results weren't made public in time for its publication. The Navy said it didn't notify its residents on base because it says it doesn't affect drinking water and it's not nearby residential housing. It has yet to schedule follow-up testing to see if that contaminated groundwater at Site 34 has spread. There is no current plan to clean up the contamination. We've got people living adjacent to where these buried containers with PFAS were. We're not testing their water, why not? So I wrote a letter and the response was, um, you know, we trust the federal government. We trust the Navy to do what's right. And it's signed by a public health official in the state of Maryland. And that's not good enough for me. When we asked why the people who live off base weren't notified or didn't have their water tested, a spokesperson said it's because there is a very low risk of exposure. At other bases across the country, service members are wondering what impact AFFF might have had on them. Reporting by the Military Times has found some women were told not to get pregnant on base. On another base, 16 cases of cancer in one family. Now, they're all questioning whether PFAS in the water was to blame. It's the multi-billion dollar question. Who is ultimately responsible for PFAS contamination? And how much would it cost to clean up? Many place some of the blame on the EPA for its bureaucracy and out-of-date chemical regulatory system. There's currently, at least as of last count, the EPA noted over 600 PFAS chemicals were in active use in the last decade. Um, and so doing a single chemical by chemical regulatory approach would take many lifetimes on that many chemicals. 
Even the military said the EPA's lack of regulation is making it hard to start planning its cleanup program. And while the Pentagon is investing hundreds of millions in investigations and temporary fixes, it's just a band-aid for a bigger problem. Coming up with a plan to actually get rid of PFAS in the environment? That's where things get tricky. As of June 2019, the military has no actual plans to clean up the contamination. And at this pace, to even start that process could take years, not to mention billions of dollars. For the communities involved, it's all moving way too slow. Our regulators need to get their heads out of the sand and listen to what these people have to say. But to understand the layers of political and legal drama unfolding today, it's important to understand what the U.S. has deemed illegal when it comes to PFAS. In short, not much. Some states are starting to develop their own guidelines, but there's no single legally enforceable drinking water standard for PFAS across the country. The EPA has issued something called a Lifetime Health Advisory for PFAS at 70 parts per trillion. That's such a minuscule amount of PFAS, most people have no frame of reference for how much that actually is. Think of it this way. 70 parts per trillion has been likened to a few drops of PFAS in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Essentially, that's how much the EPA says a human can safely drink throughout their lifetime. But it's just a suggestion, not a regulation, and not legally enforceable. The water near some military bases has reached levels much higher than the EPA's health advisory. In Louisiana, PFAS levels have reached more than 10 million parts per trillion. The military isn't denying its role spreading AFFF. When we reached out to the Pentagon for comment, a spokesperson said the department takes its cleanup responsibility seriously. The EPA said it would propose a regulatory determination for PFOA and PFOS by the end of the year, and that it's in the process of listing PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under CERCLA. But as it stands now, different states have different rules. And depending on those rules, the military may have to spend a lot more money to clean things up. In Oscoda alone, the Air Force has already spent millions on PFAS. We've invested $88.9 million at Wordsmith, and the PFAS PFOA to date is $14.9 million. And that we anticipate uh, the cleanup activities at Wordsmith costing another $190 million. That's just one single base out of the more than 400 and counting. There's another layer of complexity when it comes to U.S. military bases something called sovereign immunity. In 2018, the Air Force claimed it after the state of Michigan tried to enforce stricter cleanup guidelines. Well, a lot of it was what I'll call legal stuff in there. But basically, it was trying to say that there is sovereign immunity for the federal government that prevents a state from coming in and telling the federal government what to do. Most of those activities were already scheduled and planned to do, but the state felt better trying to issue some enforcement requirements, but we feel we're taking all the appropriate actions. Primarily, our focus is on protecting the drinking water. It's difficult to challenge the military politically, legally, and otherwise. In New Mexico, the state environmental department and the Air Force are suing each other over PFAS cleanup. And then there's the question of what responsibility lies with the producers and manufacturers. Two of the military's AFFF suppliers are Tyco and ChemGuard. A spokesperson for the companies said that while there's no reliable evidence that PFAS cause illness at levels humans are generally exposed to, they support continued research on the compounds. And that they've transitioned to what some see as a less dangerous version of the compound, though that's up for debate in the scientific community. In 2018, roughly 100 lawsuits over AFFF were consolidated in South Carolina. As of July 2019, that multi-district litigation is still pending. PFAS isn't a household term yet, but Congress has taken notice to what's going on, particularly on military bases. This session alone, lawmakers have introduced at least 20 bills that address PFAS. But even with regulations in place for lead, the Flint water crisis is still playing out five years later. And when it comes to PFAS, many states aren't even testing for it yet. 
behind the scenes, DOD has been pushing the EPA to loosen its PFAS cleanup standards from the existing 70 part per trillion threshold to 380 parts per trillion. That's nearly six times the existing health advisory. And that could save the Pentagon a lot of money when it comes time to actually form a cleanup plan. Meanwhile, the Department of Defense is still pouring millions into research and investigations, much of which it says will take years to finish. I fully understand uh, the desire to have it move faster. We are being assertive in, in our moving forward. Testing is ongoing, and I think we're still learning more about the extent of that contamination and how it may be impacting surrounding communities. These communities, I'm going to say they're going to pop up, they're, they already exist, it's just a matter of finding them. Uh, they're going to happen over and over and over and over. So what happens when a town finds out its water is toxic? I, I lived in the town, we drank from the river, right there, out there where the foam is. In many cases, it's up to the communities themselves to uncover the damage that's been done. In another video, we'll meet with some citizens who were tired of waiting for officials to tell them what's going on. So they're doing their own digging. 